It is seven o'clock. Let's get started. Um, we have an agenda. Sean, if you wouldn't mind putting that agenda up on the screen. Got it. Okay. Um, Our key. We can kind of take a look. We're going to have, we're not going to have an update by closer regarding traffic calming measures, but I can give an update on the update. <laughs> We're gonna, we might have a fairly short meeting tonight and we can all uh, get ready for the hail that might be coming. I hope not. <laughs> yeah, we'll need that for sure. I'm knocking on wood. Okay, can I get um, somebody to um, approve the uh, uh, agenda, please? To make a motion. Motion to approve the agenda. Okay, uh, I second. second. Thank you. Uh, Taryn is not here tonight. She had a work um, issue. So I'll be taking notes while, uh, while I play president. You can take minutes from the video. Okay. Oh, it, it, to me, I mean, I just, it, this is going to be a pretty uncomplicated meeting. There's no motions, basically, so it'll be pretty easy. Um, can we, uh, we had the minutes in the um, uh, newsletter, the beacon. Would any of you who hope, happen to have the beacon please peruse it and make a motion to approve? I don't think we actually voted on the agenda. That's important. <laughs> Darn, there's always one Robert Rules person in this house. <laughs> this this <laughs> neighborhood. Um, in for a penny. <laughs> um, for all those in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. 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 All those aye. against, say no. Okay, moving right along. So when you're ready, if someone might make a motion to approve um, the agenda or suggest changes or something. Motion to approve. Okay. Uh, second? Second. All in favor, aye. 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 All in favor, no. Okay, good for <clears throat> I don't have any general announcements. Does anybody else have any general announcements? Okay, a D1, oh, I know, we, we, there is in the making a D1 um, candidates runoff form. And I will be putting that on Facebook as well as you know, sending it out to as many people as I can. Um, District two and District five are having theirs uh, this coming week and they should be really good and people are working Kim, on them. So kind of keep an eye out for that. Kim? The uh, safe officer just sent you some stuff he wants to share. I have it on my desktop already. If you okay, want great. It. I was hoping okay, you received that. Sure, no. Okay, we, we do, we'll do that then after the treasurer's report. Perfect, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, is there um, any newcomers in our group tonight? Um, this is Cassandra, can't you? Sorry, I, you don't see my face today. I'm still multitasking with work. But um, I'm a newbie here. I think it's my third week I moved into the area. Um, so just listening in and seeing what's going on. Right, right. Oh, good. Awesome. Now there's the pressure to be entertaining, so you'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Like uh, with all this COVID stuff, I work for HGB in the corporate area. So um, I'm used to this Zoom and um, this is pretty much 50% my life. If I'm not on site, I'm on Zoom right now. Well, thank you, Cassandra. I'm, we're all, you know, welcome you to the neighborhood and there's lots of cool opportunities if you'd like to become more involved as you get settled in. There's all kinds of fun and cool things. Um, what and block do you live on? You don't have to give us your exact address, but about where do you live? What block? Um, I'm on Lowood on that street. She's near me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, welcome, Cassandra. Thank you so much. Uh, is there anybody else that's new? And okay, treasurer's report. Okay, uh, hopefully everybody had a chance to look at the treasurer report in the newsletter. So um, started out the month at eight thousand two hundred forty million dollars. Can you share it? In April of eight hundred. Oh, uh, Diane, we're having a little trouble with the audio. We can't really hear you. Oh, okay. It's not on mute. 
The no. okay actually sounded better. That's what I was gonna say. How about now? Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, eight hundred thirty-one dollars of revenue. That was uh, a good ad revenue in the month of five hundred four dollars. And then we received a check for the fundraiser night at that chicken and pickle of three hundred twenty-six dollars three cents. Speak toward the screen. That's where you're cutting off when you turn. Oh, okay. And then we had um, $446 of expenses. That was primarily uh, to stock up on paper for the newsletter. So we ended the month $8,632.10. So pretty much, good month. How much was the chicken and pickle? We got $326.63. So that was... That was all okay. Well, how much was the final total, Diane? $326. No, I mean for the, the oh, the Andy balance $8,632.10. Sorry, I can't keep you up. There was, there was a time when 300 and something dollars in our treasures meant we were rich. I, I think Jerry Lockie and Susan are the only two other people. We're, we're, we're rich. Yeah, like, well, we got over 100 bucks. I, I think, yeah. We need to become a pack and uh, start uh, donating to all the good guys. Uh, or not. <laughs> oh, watch it, Jerry. We're the good guys. <laughs> We're the good guys. Okay. Um, so, Don't Officer, we're well, talking about a good guy, Officer Ben Maciel. Um, uh, welcome and thank you for being here. Oh, of course. Uh, how is the mic sound? I had to adjust it here a minute ago. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, very perfect. Good. Very good. Very good. Well, uh, welcome to the uh, community of uh, Beacon Hill. It's uh, good to be here and good to talk to everyone here. Um, I had just some information I was going to uh, share here with the group. Uh, first of all, I, was, I sent the crime stats. I don't know if you're able to share that on the screen, but I shared the- Give, uh, him, a, give, him, a, give him a second, Hill. Yeah. Daniel will pull one, it up. One second, I'll get that up there in a moment. Okay, great. And this is for the month of April. So it'll have the previous five months. We reviewed them last month, but this will have the April category. So uh, from the review, a quick snapshot, I see an increase there in, uh, on vice, uh, vice violations. And what is considered vice? Uh, it's probably... Uh, something related along the lines of uh, drug enforcement or uh, actually there was another category I was looking at here. Uh, there was a little bit of an uptick on uh, some of the uh, drug arrests there. So would, would uh, vice be more of solicitation? Yes. But just from the looks of it there, uh, pretty much, I think also on the, uh, that category there it stayed about the same there those are probably from the uh, porch uh, stolen packages but i encourage the community to report anything uh whether it's the smallest thing you may think it is or if you see anyone suspicious in the neighborhood just uh, please report that to us so we can follow up on right. okay now you can see uh so we're looking at the uh, month of uh, april there uh, last month i have presented uh, the previous months there, but now we're in April. So if you want to take a quick look at that there and just for comparison purposes. What does emergency detention mean? It went from zero to nine. That one would be a particular, uh, let's say a person may be in distress. Uh, they have suicidal uh, tendencies. Uh, that's generally the category of an emergency detention. Uh, basically, we're not arresting them. We're uh, detaining them. We're gonna take them. There's local hospitals in the area. Um, we'll take them there uh, for medical evaluation, uh, for mental health services as well. Okay. Uh, basically that holds them for about 72 hours. Now they can be released before then, but generally uh, it's recognized somewhere between 24 to 72 hours depending. So, but that's what that would be uh, an emergency detention. Just based on people talking on Facebook, there does seem to have been an uptick in um, 
not necessarily people who were violent, but someone who might have been picked up in that sort of situation. There was a woman. Uh, there were there were several that happened where it was you know someone in the alley randomly lighting something on fire and seemed to be in fear for her own life, but it wasn't based on any kind of reality. And um, so maybe that's part of that column there. That's that is probably uh, the case. That sounds like it may uh, fit that category there. Exactly. Information report. What is that? I'm, information that can be a variety of things. Uh, there's not going to be one or two specific things. That may be uh, someone running, wanting to report um, uh, some maybe something that wasn't a, a crime, but no, it's worthy of reporting the incident. Uh, could have been for uh, the insurance company, uh, various things. It's not one that's normally associated with a crime. So, so Officer Maciel, this Jerry. Um, yes, sir. Good to see you. Would Good to hear you. Is would dumping or um, those kinds of things be on a list like this? Uh, I mean, because they're reports, but they're not catching anybody. You know, no one's going to really catch anyone dumping. I don't think, but it's important to the community garden and the park. Sure is. Yes, sir. I'm gonna, uh, and I want to take this opportunity to to uh, really thank Officer Maciel for his work on getting the park police involved and getting and uh, also Ruby Luna uh, with code compliance in that area. Thank you. And yes, I have actually been uh, patrolling the park myself. Um, I attached here and I'm sure you'll see the picture of it there. And uh, thanks to the uh, community for stepping up there, helping out and uh, gathering the uh, debris that was set there on the uh, curb. Uh, and, we uh, contacted uh, Solid Waste and they were able to help us out and they removed uh, the uh, debris that was collected from the, uh, the community. Um, I do try to monitor that area behind the church. Uh, just a few days ago, I saw a, a bed there. Oh yeah, there's, there's, that's of course, that's the collection there. Oh. Uh, it was a couple weeks ago, but we got that picked up. But, it is a continuous effort. Uh, just a few days ago, I saw another bed sitting behind the church. So I don't know if somebody donated it that there or uh, someone may have picked it up from the bulk collection and dragged it behind the church. Or I don't know if anybody has any knowledge on that, but that's probably something that we're going to want to get out of there pretty quick. I've, I've uh, been in contact with Officer uh, Herrera. Um, I think it's Fidencio. Um, Yes. And, uh, all those trash cans that you see there are, are still there in full, um, but they are going to, to remove those completely. Just haven't been done yet. Yeah, so that was my understanding when I talked to uh, Solid Waste last week. I've been uh, trying to keep tabs on that. So, but that is my understanding as well. Now you mentioned the uh, Linear Park itself also has some cans. Where are those located at? I don't think they're on Capitol Street, are they? They're actually the uh, community garden cans and they're put out on Gramercy. Okay, they're on Gramercy. They're the community garden, yeah. Okay, perfect. But again, I appreciate uh, the efforts. And like I said, it's a continuing effort. So yep. uh, anytime, uh, and I really appreciate uh, the fence there. I know it was a small repair y'all made. Yes, uh, that's Blake. Blake McAnally fixed that hole in the fence that yes. was going through. That was really great of him just to uh, cut off the uh, path there. Right. Anybody walking through there. So but that's really appreciated. And uh, another thing that's come to my attention is uh, uh, graffiti in the area. So I would really like uh, any of the residents, if that is seen, please uh, notify us whether that would be uh, contacting myself or I've included here the 311 app, just a reintroduction of that. I've personally used this app as well. Um, you can uh, download this onto your phone and it has uh, capabilities. You can take pictures of the, the graffiti, where it's at, uh, put some small comments on there and it's gonna generate a case number within it. So you can actually go back and review and it gives you an update of where that's at. So, but again, I'm sure some of you or many of you have this app on your phone, but I just wanted to reintroduce that again, just in case someone wasn't aware of the other things that you can do on there. There's graffiti, 
uh, garbage dumping, animals, permits. There's quite a few things there within this app. It's very useful. So I would highly recommend this uh, particular app. Yeah, I'll say the graffiti folks have been among the most responsive of the departments that I've contacted through there. So if you've got graffiti concerns, by all means, take advantage of that. Does anybody have any questions for me at this point or any concerns or anything they may have, have seen? Um, other neighborhoods have been talking about the Safe Officer Program and what ways that can that maybe community can advocate for things that might help make your job easier. I know we've talked about things like, you know, the, the, the you should get crime stats on your neighborhoods like once a week, like so that you have a picture of what's happening. And we've talked about, you know, maybe your hours, the other duties you have should be lessened so that you can concentrate more on safe duties. Do any of those, we would never advocate before we'd ask safe officers themselves what, you know, what it is they need, but um, do those sound like useful suggestions? Oh, yes. And that I would definitely uh, sh probably share. Okay. Uh, but of course, we would share that with our supervisors that uh, this is what the uh, community is asking. So okay. I'll, make, I'll cool. make sure we get enough neighborhoods together and, and, and send that in. So it's not just one neighborhood, but lots of neighborhoods. Is there anything else that neighborhoods can advocate um, that will make your job more effective? Basically, uh, two-way communication is best. I've actually uh, been out in the neighborhood, and of course, I will continue. Um, I like to contact uh, folks if I see them out in the yard or if I see them walking, and I'll stop and talk to them and just try to get their input uh, or to see if they're a part of the uh, neighborhood association. And if not, <laughs> if they heard them that they should. Uh, be members of the or Zoom or the uh, the newsletter that's sent out. Involvement, community involvement. So I highly recommend that to the uh, residents that I've come across. I'll continue to do so as I meet them. Can you give Can you give us some time of a picture of you so we recognize you on the street? Here, <laughs> so okay. Hi. Uh, oh, okay. Welcome. Now we're you on. have a face. Now Thank you for finally giving us crime stats. We've been asking for that for a long time. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, that's very important for you as a community to see what's going on in the neighborhood. And then your real name, besides oh. the numbers and <laughs> letters. What oh, my name is it's, uh, Officer Ben Marcel. Oh. Uh, it just listed like that. This is a city computer, so it has a particular way of listing. The, that's my identification number. So, Ben Marcel. M A C I E L Marcel. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Would you Would you like to have a supply? You You say you talk to people, talk about the neighborhood association. Would you care for your own small supply of newsletters that you could hand out? Because it's no. always good to say oh and here is on the back uh, that's a great idea uh where can i obtain those at sir mr lockyer can i get those from someone or well i'm the one that copies them every month over great. at Cindy's house so you tell me how many you want every month okay. or you want them delivered and we'll get them there great. and we'll get you what you need that's perfect i'll uh, send you an email and then we can uh, figure out the location but yes i really would like to do that in case you know, there may be some that are getting missed. So, yeah. well, thank you, sir. we appreciate we appreciate you and your and your job you're doing. I'll thank connect you. you two later. Okay. okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Okay. Um, and all of you, it's in on the agenda, but it's also in the newsletter. Uh, we have a, a crime uh, safe officer liaison contact. It's a group, so um, it's just an email. So it's bahana.crime at gmail.com. So if there are issues, um, you know, sometimes the board will get emails from residents and I can send them straight to Officer Maciel, but I can also send them to this group. And I believe, Mas Officer Maciel, you've already talked to um, one of the I members. Sure have, certainly and have. We can, we can double back and contact residents and say, how's it going? You know, are you still having those problems? Are things better? It's Absolutely. just you know, a way for us to help check up on people. So we're glad that, that people have stepped up. It's not a crime prevention. It's not a neighborhood watch. It's just simply a kind of neighborhood care 
group that will will uh, liaison with the with safe officer. Well, thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Thank uh, you. Good yeah. to be here. Okay, so um, I'm not, we have a possible update. Uh, we thought COSA would be giving us some, some traffic calming updates on, on measures for Michigan Avenue. They are not ready to do that yet. We are definitely contacting the councilman and the city to make sure that we don't fall off the radar, that that does get done, um, but they're not quite done with the studies yet. Um, so I want, I don't really want to talk too much about what Sean is doing because he's such a good, um, he can, he can really describe the neighbors helping neighbor programs, Sean, but I'm very proud of his work that he's done on this. I'm proud and it'll be a big help to our neighborhood. Well, thank you. And Cynthia gives me far too much credit because basically what happened was Cynthia and Sarah and Chris all got in a Zoom room together and had good ideas and I just got to write them down. So uh, <laughs> what I'll be sharing with you is essentially the fruits of their collective brains here with uh, the odd contribution from me. So let me go ahead and switch over to, uh, to the appropriate video here. And if I've done this right, you should be able to see me and see my slide. Is that all working right? Yes. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, as you all may recall, what our goal was after the winter storm was to get together and talk about ways that the Neighborhood Association could help make sure that, uh, that our neighbors are having their needs met. And this was brought into sharp, the need for this was brought into sharp relief by dint of the winter storm. And obviously, Sarah and the Impact Guild and all the people who sort of congregated around that effort were instrumental in making sure that the needs of the people around the neighborhood were met during a really difficult time. But we wanted to take some of those lessons and, and bring them forward and come up with some ideas for how to make a more long-term sustainable effort to meet those needs. So these are the recommendations we came up with. <clears throat> um, the high level recommendation is essentially that we establish under the auspices of the Neighborhood Association, a permanent Neighbors Helping Neighbors Committee. And that committee at a minimum would facilitate a variety of goals. The first of those is gathering information on the needs around the neighborhood. And we do that through a couple of different channels. One would be having dedicated communication channels, having a phone number that is text capable and an email address that are both dedicated to just this committee and communicating with it. The newsletter, of course, is the thing that folks around the neighborhood who don't know anything else about the Neighborhood Association know about. So the newsletter is going to be an anchor for our communications here. Um, ideally, any content that we publish the newsletter would be bilingual and would also include the content methods that I talked about a moment ago, the phone and email. Now, second only to the newsletter itself, the thing that most people around the neighborhood are aware of is the community events, and especially the holiday party and the national night out. These are the most <laughs> visible manifestations of the association to residents. And if we have a presence at those events, it'll be an excellent way to gather useful information on our neighbor's situations. <clears throat> Another idea that had come up for discussion was that of surveys were check-in cards. So basically, if uh, what one thought was if we had short surveys and keep the demographic data to minimum, we don't ask too much about people, just sort of the minimum that's necessary to be able to contact them so it doesn't seem intrusive, um, <clears throat> that would be a useful way to get information. And we'll definitely want to leave out matters of ethnicity and income level and all sorts of that sort of stuff, as well as making it clear that it's only for use of the neighborhood association so that it doesn't feel like weird or invasive or like you may want to put on your tinfoil hat before filling it out. The idea of a check-in cards was also another thing we had proposed. And basically that's just a little card that somebody would drop off with a neighbor saying, hey, I'm here for you. If you need a hand with something, here's my phone number. Uh, get in touch if there's something I can help you with. We've also put out the idea of a welfare check tool. Uh, the current manifestation of that that we're thinking about is having something on the website or through other channels where you can basically just request a welfare check for a neighbor. You say, hey, that fellow down the street, I'm a little concerned about, would love it if somebody could just stop in and say hello and make sure they're doing all right. 
And then lastly, there are a lot of organizations that we may be able to take advantage of uh, to gather information on who might have needs around the neighborhood. Uh, that can include churches, might include senior centers, uh, various businesses may even be aware of needs within their clientele. And then we'd be able to uh, also coordinate with some of the city organizations to help, uh, help coordinate that information well and wisely. So once we've gathered information about the needs, the next step is to gather information about volunteers and resources that are, neighbor, that are available through the neighborhood and through the city. Uh, first of these I wanted to mention is the NHSD, the City's Neighborhood and Housing Services Department. They're kind of a, a new organization. They're eager to prove themselves and to make themselves useful, and they should be a really good organization, good resource for assembling information on the city services that might be relevant and other helpful organizations under the city's umbrella. We'd also use those same emails uh, phone numbers to allow volunteers to contact us and to get them in touch with people. Uh, the newsletter, again, is going to be super important. Neighborhood events will not only be gathering information on needs, but on resources that are available there. Um, <clears throat> we also, you know, have a lot of traffic on our Facebook group, and there are a fair number of people who use the Nextdoor app as well. Uh, both of these are going to be excellent ways to get in touch with volunteer help. Facebook is a little bit more curated and a little bit more controlled, while Nextdoor tends to have a little bit more in the way of uninhibited discussions. Uh, but we think both of those will be valuable. And then there's a whole litany of city resources that will want to help people connect up with where it's appropriate. The city council offices, San Antonio Housing Authority, Department of Health and Human Services, council committees, uh, including Culture and Neighborhood Services Committee, Community Health and Equity Committee, and a variety of boards and commissions, such as the City and County Joint Commission on Elderly Affairs. All this making sense so far? Any questions about what we've covered? Okay, so the next step is when we've gathered all this information, what we need to do is to compile it in a way that it will be useful. Um, <clears throat> we're thinking to combine this into a central database. And the, and the reason for that is not any kind of big brother oversight kind of thing, but because they're gonna be different people who are trying to help and everybody needs to be able to access that information and be able to uh, connect people in a meaningful way. So. The goal is as we learn more about our neighbors and about the needs and the resources that they have, we'll need to accumulate this information uh, just to keep the continuity going among different folks who may be helping at different periods of time or from different roles. And, uh, and in addition to that, we've also talked about a flowchart. Now the purpose of the flowchart is basically to be able to identify a need that somebody in the neighborhood might have and to match it up to an appropriate resource. And that might be an individual in the neighborhood that might be a city organization, that might be a food bank, it could be any number of things. But having the central flowchart will allow us to do that in an efficient way. And we can also publish that flowchart. So if people feel uncomfortable coming and asking for help, they'll also have that resource to be able to say, all right, I, uh, I, uh, my cupboard is bare and I need some food. How do I get that? And be able to follow the chart through and, and engage in some self-service there as well. Um, and we hope to probably put that on the website or some other place that's easily accessible for anybody for whom it might be useful. So once we've got this great big pile of information, uh, none of that's useful until we actually connect the needs and resources. So um, we want to identify different ways of making those connections and those will take different forms uh, during emergencies than they do during day-to-day -day life in Beacon Hill. Uh, we will need to have people who are in charge of connecting the needs to uh, resources by means of uh, maybe one-on-one -on -one conversations. It may be by developing and distributing information through the channels that we've talked about already. Um, <clears throat> and then during emergencies like the recent winter storm, we're also going to want to be sure that there's somebody available 24-7 to help coordinate the relief efforts and to get critical needs within the neighborhood met as quickly as we can. Now, one of the really interesting ideas that came out of this was the idea of block ambassadors. <clears throat> uh, we'll 
talk more about those in just a moment, but basically block ambassadors are going to be individuals in the neighborhood who volunteer to focus on the needs, welfare, and social structure of a small region within the neighborhood. That might just be a single block where they live, it might be a few blocks around, uh, probably more than that is going to be more than any single person can bite off. But um, this is, I think, going to be a pretty critical role within, uh, within this structure. So speaking of, we have a variety of different roles that I uh, wanna talk about just a little bit more to be clear on what each of these persons will be doing. The first up is the committee chair. That person or people, this may be a shared responsibility, would act as a leader and a central point of contact for questions or for discussions about the committee business. In addition, we would have somebody filling the role of dispatcher. The dispatcher is the person who will be responsible on a day-to-day -day basis for connecting the incoming needs to the resources that we have identified. Additionally, during emergency times, these are the people who will be handling all the incoming requests and making sure that, uh, that we are addressing people's needs quickly as they come in. Now, as you can see, especially during emergency times, it may be important to have more than one person filling that need because providing 24 by 7 coverage is going to be really difficult for human beings who need to sleep from time to time. Um, this person, again, is going to be fielding voicemails, emails, texts, and phone calls asking for help and making using the flowchart and the database that we've established to connect those incoming requests for additional help. And that may be as concrete as having somebody go and help that person directly. It may be that we don't have anything suitable, but we can tell them, hey, try calling 311 and see if the city can provide any guidance on this issue. Um, in any case, getting positive feedback and getting an answer, making sure that they know that they have been heard and they have somebody on their side will be critical for the dispatcher. Block ambassadors, we talked a little bit about already. <clears throat> um, they'll be focused on a smaller region within the neighborhood. These roles are gonna be fairly loosely defined because the needs of one block may not actually be identical to the needs of another block. So one block ambassador may tailor their response to their neighbors and do things a little differently elsewhere in the neighborhood. Um, it's sometimes the case that the block ambassadors are well positioned to discover and help with a need without needing to involve anyone else. And this is great. Neighbors helping neighbors works best with direct relationships. However, it's also important for the ambassador to, to communicate what he or she learns about the needs and resources in her area back to the dispatcher so that we are able to record that information and have that available for future efforts. And lastly, we within our neighborhood have a broad range of skills, capabilities, and resources that neighbors, uh, that many of us are willing to share. Um, and that might be somebody needs welding. It might be something as simple, simple as uh, making grocery store run for a neighbor who's housebound for a period of time. So as we learn about these, we'll want to, again, make a record of the ways that everybody has volunteered to help and how often they're willing to help. And then the dispatcher will be able to use that information to connect needs to appropriate people. So <clears throat> during the course of these conversations, we identified a few challenges that we're going to need to think carefully about. The first of these is language barriers. Obviously, not everybody in our neighborhood speaks English. Not everybody in our neighborhood speaks Spanish. Um, <clears throat> and there are probably some other languages at play as well. So in order to keep the barriers to inclusion in all of this as low as possible, we should do our best to include content in both English and Spanish wherever possible. So we'll need to identify some folks who are bilingual and able to translate. Uh, Google Translate is awesome as far as it goes, but nobody is going to mistake what comes out of Google Translate as being something that a native speaking human being would actually write. So we don't want to lean on that any more than we need to. Secondarily, um, there, there's sometimes embarrassment about admitting needs, so we want to be able to gather this information in a way that's as supportive and as non-threatening as possible, and, and keep, it, uh, keep it fairly private. We're not going to be sharing that, those needs broadly. Uh, we don't want to embarrass anybody, but we do want to be able to know how we can help folks. 
There are also different levels of access to technology that folks have. Some people have non-smartphones and may just be able to call or text. Some people are very comfortable in the world of web and email. So we want to be able to both make any information that comes out of this available as cross as many channels as possible, but also make it possible to contact the committee in as many different ways as possible so that everybody has access who wants it. And then lastly, there is a significant fear among some residents that contacting adult protective services or other city programs creates a risk of having elders or folks who are infirm moved from their homes against their will or having their properties that are in disrepair condemned. Now, obviously, we want to avoid doing anything that will negatively impact the very people we're trying to help. So to this end, uh, Cynthia Christina Wright, who is the uh, involved in the Alta Vista Neighborhood Association, and Chris Spilker have been initiating conversations with the city program administrators, asking questions about, uh, about that kind of risk and how we bring city resources to bear without, uh, without putting our neighbors in an awkward position. And they've had some pretty encouraging things to say about that. Um, basically, the city is very much in the camp that those actions are actions of last resort. And if there are, uh, if there are relatives or if there are other ways of getting help, then, uh, then they will absolutely try to very hard to avoid those. Um, okay, so given what we've covered so far, there are volunteers needed for several different roles. The first is gonna be a chairperson or chairpersons. Second will be that dispatcher role. Again, we'll probably need at least two of those. Uh, block ambassadors, we will need a wealth of to cover the neighborhood. This should be a fairly low impact. And again, as I'd mentioned before, fairly customizable role. So you can tweak that if you choose to be a block ambassador. You can tweak that in a way that feels comfortable and feels appropriate for your particular block or the particular blocks you're covering. And then last, we will also need individual volunteers who are willing to help with ever, whatever things you're willing to help with, you know, groceries, checking in on the neighbors, um, whatever tasks might need doing there. So that at a glance is kind of our program and the summary of it, what we're recommending to the board, we enact. Uh, again, neighbors helping neighbors, vecinos ayudando a vecinos, we would really like to make this happen. So any questions about what we've covered so far? I'd like to make a couple of comments. Um, so thank you so much for the, you know, the presentation and the work. This is something that as we put it in practice, we may find ourselves tailoring it or, and I want to emphasize like this came out of that meeting the needs of over 175 families right after the storm and just water and food showing up like loaves and fishes in the wilderness. I mean, it was just almost miraculous how food and water kept coming and people doing plumbing for other for other neighbors. So we want to be prepared for the next big thing that happens. Hopefully that won't be soon. But but not only that, but there there are a lot of, you know, some people it, it doesn't have to be a storm. Sometimes it's an elder who hasn't had water for a couple of months. Or it's somebody who's about to lose their apartment or home and they don't know what to do or a family that needs food. We have a huge list that we've compiled during COVID of resources. And, and it's not even so much that you have to go out there and do that for people, but you have to help them get those resources that they need with the city. And we have people to help us. We have um, our, our uh, neighborhood engagement officer, Barbara Buford at uh, Neighborhood Housing Services Department is a great resource. But we, we are able pretty much, if someone called me tomorrow and said, where do I get food? Well, I know Christ Episcopal does Saturday food deliveries or does, you know, that you get, that, that those are the kinds of things we need help with. So I don't want to leave people to feel like if they volunteer, they're going to be constantly out in somebody's house. It's, it's really the most important time is when we have an emergency. And let's see, was there anything else? Um, no, that's it. I think we have a chat question though. Oh, someone's very happy, yay. <laughs> I, think, I think this is the best of who we are. 
I mean, we do all kinds of fun and thanks to Heart of the Neighborhood and, and we do porch parties, we do happy hours, we do picnics in the park and movie night. And those are all extremely important for community. But this is, this is something that's also needed in our neighborhood. And I'm very proud of neighbors who have stepped up and helped and donated a couple of hours a month to this kind of thing. Absolutely. So it sounds like there are no particular questions outstanding. So um, I'll throw out the call to action because I understand that's the good thing to do for this sort of thing. So as I had mentioned, we need volunteers for these various roles. If you are interested in volunteering, interested in helping with the efforts in any way, please contact Cynthia, myself, or one of the other board members. And we will, uh, we will help coordinate getting things underway there. And if there's a particular role that you are keen on, please mention that as well. I also want to mention that we're going to take this citywide. Um, Tier 1 is going to, I think, try and partner with the Bowen um, Center and do a forum um, where we take what you have developed here with, you know, helps of neighbors and take this in terms of citywide that neighborhoods can be a point of contact when there are emergencies. They're a, a natural skeleton. They're already a structure in place for the, you know, to helping people on a micro level. So thank you, Sean. This will have even effects outside our own community. The way to hear it. Jump in for just a second to uh, push the block ambassador idea a little more. Um, uh, Kim and I have sort of taken on that role for ours already. We had a social and met some of the neighbors who we only knew just by visually and didn't even necessarily know names. And that uh, was went quite well. Uh, it was pretty painless, and actually pretty easy. And, uh, you know, I, and it, it lasted longer than I thought it would because everyone was kind of enjoying talking to each other and meeting each other. Uh, and I know that Robert and Diana did something, well, well maybe a couple of years ago now. I think that went well for y'all. So uh, if you don't want to be the ambassador yourself, still start trying to spread the word around on your block of, and see if somebody might want to do something like that because uh, it was quite enjoyable. And I, we have those some of those connections now and have some phone numbers, things. So if something does happen, we are able to reach out to folks on our blog now. So. so what what might be helpful is you and Diane, if you just wrote a little paragraph, the newsletter, and maybe for social media, talking about your experience doing that, because people then will see, oh, that isn't hard. I could do that. That'll be fun. Yeah, yeah. we we need to do a write up. Diana, Diana and Robert did write an article when they had theirs a few years ago. Yeah, and what but, what was handy when we had the snowstorm was that uh, we had a list of numbers. So that we sent a mass text, uh, how are you doing, who needs what, that kind of thing. Came in real handy to have that information on the, on the block. Yeah, exactly. For the last uh, 25, maybe even 30, you know, about 25 years, I have tried every spring and every fall to do a block picnic, let's put it that way. We don't close off the street or anything. Uh, we just pick somebody's house. We haul uh, tables and chairs. Somebody brings a grill. Uh, everybody brings their own meat to grill and then a side dish to share. Uh, now, we've not done it every spring and every fall, but it, it's a really nice thing. And um, I usually get um, at least half of the neighbors we just, for mine, we just do the thousand block of Agarita, and I, we always get at least 10, you know, half of the households. So it's not that hard. I have a little flyer that I could share um, that you just stick in somebody's door. The first time you do it, there's a lot of questions. Ooh, what should I bring? What should I bring? Did, after you do it a couple of times, I just put out the flyer and everybody shows up. They know what to do. You know, it's... Mm -hmm. I highly recommend it. And also at the end of this meeting, I don't want to take up meeting time. At the end of the meeting, I would like to talk to some, if people would stick around, I have some questions in um, uh, having to do with helping a neighbor that's going to need to store their, um, their all of everything in their house for about six months. So I'd like to discuss some ideas on that. But anyway. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. You're one of the people that inspired this whole thing and your work with helping your neighbor. So you went, you've gone above and beyond. So thank you. Um, okay, there's no more questions. Uh, can we do committee reports? Animal care? 
Yeah, sure. So we are going to have a microchipping event, free microchips for residents. Um, that is going to be Saturday, May 29th. It's going to be in the Lanier Park, the section at Ellesmere and Michigan, which is where we also show the movies by the basketball court. Um, so if you're interested in that, you need to reach out to me. Use the information on the back of the newsletter. I have no idea where I got this phone number from that I put on the front of the newsletter because it's just completely wrong. So a very kind woman in Alta Vista reached out to Cynthia. So she's getting calls. Um, yeah, uh, in any event. Um, yeah, so we were able to get 60 microchips donated from a... Um, microchipping company, um, kind of a next-gen company. They're, they're, they're kind of new kids on the block and they're doing a really good job. Uh, so a uh, woman on the board, Joe Tick, happens to be uh, friends with the founder of this company and so secured a donation. So they will be free. We'll accept um, uh, donations if anybody wants to and it will allow us to purchase more. But even, at, even when we get to the point that we need to buy more, they're only three bucks a piece and that includes lifetime registration. So um, if you have a cat, we'll come to you because uh, we don't want to have a bunch of cats in the linear park. Um, so yeah, we're excited about it. I, I actually got these microchips, oh gosh, probably six months ago and I've been really dragging my feet on it. And so Daniel, we'll give Daniel credit for really pushing it forward. So. Um, a special invitation to anybody here right now. Um, we need to practice before this event. So if you have an animal that needs a chip, uh, we'll, we'll come to you and do it at your place uh, so we can get a, a few more under our belt. Your cat already has one. I can't put a second chip in. Kim, does it hurt? No, uh, not any more than a shot. Um, okay. You know, it, it's a decent sized needle, but it's not. Um, Susan, I'm happy to help you, but I, I thought your cat had a chip already. I don't think so. We can scan okay. it, but I don't think so. Okay, I thought we did that already. But... Okay, well, thank you, Kim. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, Benevolent, uh, Mrs. Zeller. Ms. Zeller. Ms. Lucy. Yes, I'm here, but I'm... Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Like I mentioned, I've been doing delivering the newsletter for 18 years. Yes, ma'am. 18 years. Uh, six blocks going up and six blocks don't coming down. I have met a lot of people a lot of wonderful people. Mm -hmm. There is a young man. Uh, he was asking me what is the benevolent fund doing. So I took a few minutes and I explained to him. We have a committee and we provide groceries, food, toys, candy for Thanksgiving, for um, uh, Thanksgiving for Christmas. And when a need comes, they will call me and then I will contact Diana because she is a treasure. So at this point, what I'm giving, we're not touching the money for the benevolent fund and it's going to be there for a while. But this young man told me that he wants to make a donation to the benevolent fund because he heard a lot about us. So my point is that as long as I'm alive, my friends and my neighbors, I am going to do the work. And sometimes it's not easy. I'm having problems with my right leg, but it's okay. I am still going to do it. And it's all for the children. And what else I want to say? I want to thank uh, Beacon Hill for giving me, giving us the support that when we need something, we feel free to call and to say, this is what we need. And people are responding. I'm doing, a, I am doing a follow-up on the two families, Juanita uh, and, uh, I can't remember the other family's name, 
So while I'm giving, I'm giving out of my own groceries without asking the benevolent fund. When the need comes, I will reach out to Diana and I will say, we need money for this. But right now I am doing donations from my own. My daughter is in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She's a nurse. And she said, Mother, what do you need? I want to help you. So that's a blessing. That's what all I can say right now. Ms. Eller, you're the poster woman for Neighbors Helping Neighbors. You were doing mm -hmm. it long before we came, ever came up with the project. And thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Um, OK, Heart of the Neighborhood, Daniel. All righty, let's see. We've got a couple events this month. Um, We'll be doing uh, one of our, it's become kind of a normal thing now, a movie night in the park. Uh, unlike what the newsletter says, it's not in March. It's not a uh, retroactive movie night. It'll be on May 22nd. Not my best work as proofreader this month, uh, mm -hmm. at least two. So, um, so May 22nd, it'll be a fairly late one. Uh, daylight saving time, not to be doing us any favor. So it won't start till 845. But we are going with a pretty short movie, so it still shouldn't be too late getting done. Uh, and more, possibly more interestingly, we have a, a new event. Um, Juan Chavez, who's a fairly new resident in the neighborhood, uh, came to the uh, picnic last month and said he wanted to host a kid's talent show. And he's taken the lead with that, and it's going to be at his house, and he's fielding uh, participants and set that up. That will be on May 23rd. That's a Sunday from 11 to 1. So if uh, you know anyone whose kids are talented, want to sing or dance or, I don't know, play the didgeridoo or whatever, but uh, mm -hmm. contact Juan and let them know this is their chance. Uh, and even if you don't have kids or know any kids who do that, just please come on by, show them some support. And it should be fun. Uh, that's it for us. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Zud, Mar uh, Cosima's not here tonight. Mark Spielman, are you prepared to give a, um, um, a, a report? Yeah. It took me a second to get it off uh, mute. Uh, yes, we've had uh, an awful lot of activity going on. The Agonier property uh, 1106, uh, we're still trying to find a way to negotiate with the uh, owner. Uh, it's a really iffy situation where we're unsure whether uh, we can't seem, we couldn't get a super majority to vote for the uh, idea that it should be designated as historic. So that leaves the ball in the uh, owner's court uh, they're saying that they'll try to follow the NCD and the, uh, you know, ideas of, of restoring the house. But, you know, the truth is they could tear it down anytime if they felt like it. So uh, we've pretty much lost the battle on that one. Uh, we're getting an awful lot of uh, the developers, particularly, uh, uh, you know, demolition companies buying houses in Beacon Hill. Uh, letting them go for a couple of years and then demolishing them and uh, wanting to put up new uh, buildings. Uh, part of the neighborhood that's most susceptible to that is the area just south of Cincinnati and to the uh, east of Blanco Road. A lot of the homes in there fall into the category of being affordable housing because they're small units that families can rent but we have to really kind of uh, decide what we want to support in there because at the same time, it's very close to a hub and could be used for, uh, you know, uh, increasing our density in that area too. And we'd like to see increased density as, as another goal. So the com conflicting uh, arguments for increasing density and preserving affordable housing are, one of the reasons I tried to get Sidel uh, Brooks involved with Councilman uh, Trevino's office to try to see what the councilman would prefer to do in that area. Uh, 
but then that word uh, just slogging through a long, long list of uh, agenda items having to do with the uh, uh, you know code issues that have come up in in recent uh, weeks. So we're a busy committee. Uh, we've fortunately got a few new members coming in and. Uh, if you know anybody who would like to serve on our committee, we're really in over our heads. We've got more work than we can possibly do. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for the work that you and uh, Kosman do by co-chairing this. This is, this is often a full-time job because they go to zoning meetings, they go to board of adjustment meetings. We write letters, we read those, we contact the councilman's office. I mean, it's a they're uh, uh, a pretty um, uh, busy group. So thank you very much. Um, so brief updates by our elected representatives. Uh, I know that uh, Councilman uh, Trevino's representative, Sidel Brooks is in the house. Sidel. Hey everyone, a few updates really quickly. Again, I'm Sidel Brooks. I'm your representative from the District 1 office, Councilman Trevino. Um, Really quick, just to piggyback off what Mark was saying. So 1206 Agarita, um, that property was recommended for historic designation originally. Um, that one needed a super majority to pass because the owner was in opposition. So unfortunately it did not receive a super majority. So the case kind of does die. Um, but I just spoke to Anna Sarabia tonight, the um, developer's representative on that project and they are still planning on mo moving forward with the plans that they had for renovation. So um, nothing really to worry about there. I'm hoping um, I'll continue to monitor with them. We don't anticipate them requesting a demolition or anything like that. Um, next we have uh, dog That's attack. That's a question. Um, I yes. know that Go ahead. The original owner didn't pull permits, and so they did some work that was not NCD um, compatible. Will they be restoring what they had done to make it compatible? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? So I know that the original owner did not pull permits and did a lot of work on the front, changed windows and doors, and it's not NCD compatible. Um, so will they, will they put the house back to, the, to meet the NCD standards? Yes, and so I know he was working with HDRC on those um, items. He, uh, of course, you're supposed to pull permits when you do uh, do work to the house. And with that, they'll let you know, hey, there's an NCD here. There are certain standards you have to meet. Um, since and he missed this and go on with the movie. I believe there are a couple of things that he needs to, um, to adjust back to the original um, the original status of, of those items. However, I do believe he was approved for a couple things. Um, but I mean, if you all want specifics on those, I can follow up with HDRC and see what was approved and what wasn't. We would like a list of that. Thank you. Okay. Just for reference, just for curiosity. No, for sure. No problem. What changes were approved? Okay, for sure. Next, um, so dog attacks, I know, um, we have loose dogs in the area and that's been an ongoing issue. Um, ACS is always responsive, but sometimes their hands are tied because they have to be able to locate the dog that, um, you know, did the attack or find the owner and, and prove that that's, you know, their dog that did that. Um, so I received two this week. Um, one was on West Linwood where two dogs attacked um, a woman and her dog, unfortunately, um, they're both okay, but there were some like minor, um, you know, she took the, the dog to the vet and everything, and she had a couple scratches herself. Um, but that is something that I'm, I'm working with ACS on. We have Officer um, Snowden in the office who's going to be responding directly to that one. And there was a dangerous affidavit that has been submitted. Um, so I'll follow up with that process. Again, if you're seeing loose dogs, if they seem violent or anything, feel free to um, give us a call. Also call ACS. Um, but we want to make sure, you know, just make sure you're safe when you're outdoors because we have received just this week, I got two different ones, um, reports of, of dog attacks. So, um, Can I make a quick comment? Um, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, uh, no, no problem. Go ahead. Residents use the linear park to uh, walk their dogs. It's much safer than being on the streets because the dogs, the few times you do encounter a stray dog, they're not protecting anything. 
So there's not the kind of, of attacking that happens if you're walking down the sidewalk and a dog is in front of their house. So the linear park is a great place to walk your dog. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely re recommend that, you know, with lots of lighting, lots of, um, you know, space for you to see things coming. Um, but yeah, just, just be safe. You know, I don't want to tell you all to carry mace or anything like that, but um, whatever is required for you to feel safe when you're out walking, I definitely recommend. Um, and then we'll follow up with ACS to make sure um, that those instant, the dogs that are, you know, doing that are picked up and whatnot. Um, well, I, a little bit of a pointed question. You said a moment ago mm -hmm. that ACS is always responsive. The things that we've seen on the Facebook posts, people have said they've reported animals and ACS has said, maybe we'll get by in three days. So I don't know what ACS is always responsive means in that context. That sounds like something other than being responsive to me. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? For sure. No, I hear that concern. So um, I know when I call it done, when I call ACS, I get a response within 24 hours um, to report these cases or ask about them. Oftentimes they have heard about it. Um, you know, they tell me they've heard about it and they've taken these steps. So I'll get the, that information back to constituents. But um, you know, if, if you've reported something and you're not able to get through to them, like definitely reach out to us because they always, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that they're not getting back to you all and they definitely should, but I know for sure they get back to us. Um, so we'll make sure, you know, if you have that concern, reach out to us and we'll take care of it. We'll make sure you get an update within um, a day or two. Gotcha. So ACS is responsive to you guys. Good to know. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, yeah, I'm sorry. I can only speak to what, I, what I've seen, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Now I'll, I'll follow up with them and let them know that that's been said. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. So I got a follow up question. So knowing what you just said, what is the councilman's office doing to make sure that ACS is becoming more responsive to the actual constituents? Sure. So if that's an issue that's happening with Beacon Hill, and I especially know that um, it's a concern for you all with, with all the loose dogs reports we're getting to, to have that response time. Um, we can set up a meeting with, um, you know, Adon and the councilman and, and myself as necessary, uh, maybe, um, you know, a couple members of the board just to address the issue and say, hey, like we need the response period to be within 24, 48 hours. Um, having a response three days after a dog attack is, is not acceptable. Um, so that's something we can definitely set up as soon as next week. Um, regarding that. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm just jotting that down with ACS and CM. Okay, uh, I just have a couple more. So then work without permits. Um, I did get a report of um, accessory dwelling units being built from garages and people getting moved in without a permit. Um, Again, this is people that decide, oh, you know, they read maybe in the code, I can do this. So they go ahead and do it without a permit. They don't know about the NCD standards. They don't know about the setbacks, that type of thing. Um, so we do have one at 705 West Elsmere that we're looking into, if that was a concern for you all. Um, just wanted to let you know that we are hearing concerns about that and we are addressing it accordingly. And um, last but not least, runoff election. So, um, Council, while Councilman Trevino did get the majority of the votes um, in the, the, the primary election, he did not get 51% of the votes, he got 48%. Um, so we are in a runoff election. Um, just wanted to let you all know that the dates to vote for early voting are May 24th through June 1st. If you have any questions about where to vote or anything like that, you can reach out to our office. Um, we'll continue to be following up on your issues, but um, you know, just personally being that I've, you know, came from a different district myself. Um, I think in times of election, it's very important to um, make sure you know your issues and, um, you know, what next steps on those were looking like in case there is a, a switch in staff or anything like that, because it's it's a really crazy time. It's a difficult time. Um, so we're, we're definitely excited. We're doing all we can. You know, I'm out there campaigning. We're all out there campaigning. And we we hope to, um, you know, stay around and continue the work that we're doing. But um, at the same time, just, you know, as neighbors, I do want to tell you, make sure that, you know, whether it's me, whether it's someone else, that your issues are still heard and that, you know, as a community, you can continue to move forward. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions or want to help out, you can reach out to me directly. Um, I'll put my info in the chat. I think it's always, it's usually in the newsletter, but I'll also put my info in the chat in case you want to reach out to me directly. Um, 
that's all I have. Does anyone have any questions? I just want to make a statement that um, we've already had one uh, district, one forum, and we've put the, the video on uh, Facebook, and we'll do that again, and please watch for the next one. It's important, if, if nothing else, to hear issues discussed that are important to neighborhoods, because these are neighborhood people putting the, these on. So I hope um, many of you will be able to attend, and then you can make decisions based on you know what, what your preferences are. Thank you. Thank you, Sadal. Uh, Cynthia, do you happen to know what date, if I'm looking on the Facebook, do you happen to know? They haven't got a date yet. They're just, District 2 and District 5 have been determined and we're just now working. No, no, you said you put a video on for the District 1 that I'll already- I'll put it on again. I'll put it on again. Okay. And it's all the candidates. It's not the, just the two, it's all the candidates. But you see them all answer the questions. Okay. Will that be on Facebook, on the Facebook neighborhood page? Yes. I'll put that up. I'll, I'll, I'll re I'll re put that on so that um, and the, was that the tier one debate or the other debate. Um, it was a tier one district one tier one debate. It was so that it concentrated was, so much on housing issues and didn't concentrate very much on anything else. No, it did not. It, it was mostly about displacement about incompatible infill about this about well, So it's not the whole picture really. No, no, that was only, it was it was from the perspective and senior issues, it was only from the perspective of, of neighborhood questions. A lot of other people have put on debates and we should look for them and also, you know, try to try to put those on as well. So there are other city issues that are very important. Thank you for bringing that up. Is that something that can be, I'm um, looking at the question, is there, a, 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 is there a way to put that on the neighborhood own site, not Facebook? Because if somebody's not on Facebook, then they can't watch it. Is that a video that can be- on, They're on YouTube. I, I don't know. I mean, let's talk offline about how to make that happen. That probably takes a, a higher pay grade than me to figure out. I don't, I'm not even on next door and I know I should be, but there's only so many hours in the day. I, I, we'll figure it out. Uh, maybe we can put it in the newsletter, although those tend to be really long, you know, long, Links. Links. I'm not sure how you get on there. If you don't have, if you're not, if you don't have a computer to begin with, I'm not sure how much a link is going to help. So no, no, they have a computer. They're just not on Facebook. Oh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. We'll put it in the newsletter. Well, no, we won't because by then everything will be. It'll be after the election. Yeah. yeah. Next time. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Sidel. Um, so is uh, Angelique. Uh, uh, Uma Tessie here? Yes, I'm here. I'm sorry uh, I haven't mispronounced your name too badly. <laughs> no problem, no worry. I just wanted to remind everybody that we still like remote and stuff. All the stuff are still working remotely. So I'm gonna post our contact information on how to get in touch with us if you need any assistance in regarding linking you to, to uh, services such as like uh, unemployment, TWC or uh, CPS. So I'm going to post contact information about that. And also we'll be posting a link on Google Drive for an e-blast so you can get up, um, upgrade about what is going on in the office through your email. So I will also post a contact on that. And as well, I will be posting Bethany number and email so you can get in touch with her if you have any questions. OK. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, so State Senator Jose Menendez is Rep. Uh, Ana Alicia Romero. Hi, good evening, everybody. Good to see you. Um, we're winding down the legislative session. Senator Menendez is still hosting every Thursday Capital Connection at 530. So if you're able to join, if you have any questions that you want to ask about the legislative session or anything, or if you have a concern that's state related, or you're not sure if where it's related, you're welcome to join. It uh, gives a 10 minute uh, update and Q&A. Also, for those of you who have a youngster you know, it's either in undergrad or in high school who's graduating, the Texas Armed Services Scholarship Program is, uh, through the uh, Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board is receiving applications. I'll put the link in the chat. So if anybody uh, knows of anybody who's eligible, you can read the uh, eligibility in that link. Um, 
session's winding down. If you have any questions, please let us know. We're still working remotely, kind of. I think by summertime, you might start working in shifts and probably have some sort of legislative update afterward, uh, either virtually or in person. We're not sure. We'll see how things go, um, if it's safe enough. And that's it for us. And I'll put our contact information also in the chat. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anna Lisa, you've been reporting to us for how many years now? Mm, Lots of them. <laughs> that's probably 10 years or something. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you. Thank you for your service to us. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Um, so uh, Congressman Lloyd Doggett, Bernadette Armandias. Not here tonight. OK. Is there any last? Uh, announcements or any concerns anyone has before we close. We're running over our hour, but okay, well, I call it adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Remember, anybody wants to stop after the recording is ended? Okay. Thank you, everybody. So we are adjourned. It is 8-11. Take care. <laughs>